Hello, this is Arthur Melman. I'm your host for this segment of GGG Insights. And this series that we're having now is really about East Hampton's future, its challenges, its opportunities, and how people can work and live out here on a full-time basis. And today we have with us Dr. George Dempsey, who has a medical practice and has had it for quite a while out here in East Hampton, and has learned to live and work and prosper, I hope. <laughs> George, could you just give us a little bit of your background before you came to East Hampton? Well, uh, trained, uh, went to UCLA and then trained at Mayo Clinic. Did my residency at Stony Brook uh, and did a fellowship year, an extra year, a little bit of uh, faculty type of work. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Hawaii. Oh my and gosh, and you came uh, back back here and it was and cold? I went to Hawaii, lived there seven <laughs> years. Daughter was born there. So kids grew up to a certain point where you realize you make a choice, either they're gonna grow up Hawaiian or they're gonna see the rest of the world and know their family, know what the rest of the world's mm -hmm. about and get a better education. And so we came here. And this is a place that goes back, uh, way back for me since the 60s. I've been coming oh. out since I was a kid. So it's, it's very familiar. It feels like home. And when did you, when did you move out here permanently? In was 2000, 2002. And did you start the same practice you have now at, at that point or? We started from scratch, yeah. Mm -hmm. Started from scratch. So you put up a little sign that says, Dr. Yep. George Dempsey, come on in? That's how it started. <laughs> yeah, it's the old fashioned way. And how does, how does what you started with differ from what you have today? Well, the one thing in common is I started with an electronic medical record. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? okay. that's, a, that's unusual. And there were only 3% in the country that were doing that. And mm -hmm. that was my intent was to start and design the office around the computer rather than someone who's designed around paper charts and then transferring the computer and all their processes and the way employees work and the way the office is organized, it doesn't really fully adapt. Mm -hmm. So I fully adapted the office and its functions around a computerized medical record from the beginning and that was unique. Now you have, you have computerized medical records. If I'm at uh, Sloan Kettering in New York City, can those folks in Sloan Kettering? Unfortunately I, not. I know that's one of the problems today. A lot of medical record repositories don't don't talk to each other. Yeah, in fact, that is actually, in my opinion, the demise of our healthcare system right now. Mm -hmm. It's a major, major problem. There's no interoperability. There's no intercommunications, um, and it, it is the biggest challenge and it's the biggest source of burnout in the medical profession, which is at least the lowest numbers I hear is 50 percent. And we're talking about physician burnout. And physician burnout means even someone who's just graduated, who's just out of training, excited to be in the profession and ready to go, this includes everyone. By the way, you, I don't know if you know this, but uh, P, uh, Cook, who's head of Apple, is now starting to think of himself as having a medical company. Mm -hmm. And his, uh, his concept, which is very simple, in the same way that I take my blood pressure and everything mm -hmm. else on this little watch, mm -hmm is to have all of my medical records on my watch. Mm -hmm. So when I walk into your office with my watch, you've mm -hmm. got my medical records, and two things. One, that guy over there can't get them and hack into mm -hmm. them, unless they yeah. can hack into my watch. Yeah. And everything you need is in your office because mm -hmm. of this inoperability, yeah. interoperability. Well, it's not even have to be, you don't need Apple. All you need is a little card, which don't is tell, Don't tell Cook you don't need Apple, please, whatever. He, he's out <laughs> of a job. He really doesn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. Because every, in Europe and other countries around the world that are not even, you know, even quite even first world countries will have a healthcare system where people have their own medical information with them and they go and they get it done. This is, uh, this is not that yeah. difficult. Yeah. But I think the way our, our country is and how we evolved in, in a capitalist nature is everybody's proprietary and we have hundreds, thousands electronic medical records that were blossoming in the early 2000s, late 90s. And so everybody has their own. They won't share their code and they won't communicate. So now it's the stage now where now the big companies are starting to merge and mm -hmm. so forth. But it's still gonna take another 10, 15 years before there really is true interoperability. Well, George, let's talk about mm -hmm. what you have in your medical practice. You, I think when we talked before, you said there was something called the East Hampton Health Foundation. Mm -hmm. and could you just give everybody yeah. an idea of what uh, that was? Yeah. And East Hampton Healthcare Foundation is not-for-profit, 501c. 
that was developed in the 90s There's a group of folks out here who come out here a lot and realized there was a need and they were able to sub solicit donations and develop programs which one of them was to build the building that we're in they bought the land and they've basically recruited doctors who they felt would be as a as a group be able to serve the community in specialties and primary care so when I go into your office though mm -hmm. uh, dr. Schoenfeld the pediatrician mm -hmm. is in the same building but she's independent of we are right? totally independent mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that attracted me to it was the development of a, a voucher system, a support system for people without insurance. Oh. And part of the donations will go to paying for that person that we were mentioning who has a cut finger without insurance. They will actually help subsidize the care of that patient. Oh, I, didn't, I had no idea about that. So I should it's pay a bit more thing. attention when I get solicited for a donation mm -hmm. by the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation. Because it's very efficient, it has very low staff, and the money goes directly to taking care of people who don't have insurance. Um, they cover mostly just the office visit, not medications, blood tests, and mm -hmm. all the other expenses or specialists. It's not an insurance program. It's just a voucher that allows them to be seen. They pay a, a copay, and the, the rest we just submit. It's on a handshake, no contracts. We've been doing this for years. Oh, wow. And what's happened is that we've really taken care of the community here that often is, has been the um, immigrant community, Mm -hmm. um, when they came, they hardly spoke English. I'm able to speak enough Spanish. And little by little, as they've evolved and got into the community and began to be able to qualify for health care plans, then we have assistance to get them on a Medicaid program, mm -hmm. and it's grown from there. Wow. And it's really made a big difference. Uh, one of the questions I've always had is, how much of your staff, you, how many staff do you have? I, in the summer, full time. <laughs> no. Well, it's all year round, same okay. staff. Oh, it's the same, um, it's the same yeah, staff? Yeah, so it depends what you call part-time or not, but it, it's uh, about almost 15, probably 14 or so. Um, and they, when they I ran the urgent care, the other office, I had over 20 mm -hmm. you know, staff people rotating around. So th you have 15 people mm -hmm. in July, and you have 15 people in January? Yeah, the same staff. Oh, really? You can't, it's not like a restaurant where you can just hire someone out of college and start, you know, uh, mm -hmm. bussing tables. You, the people in the office that I have are highly trained. Even the basic medical system or receptionist takes six months or a year to really get up to speed to what, to the complexity of delivering care now. It's highly complex. A receptionist job is not like, uh, it's not like uh, that's, selling That's just bagels. saying hello. <laughs> no, yeah, no, they do lots of stuff while they're there. Do they do a lot of the inputting for the insurance reimbursement yeah. and stuff like that? They have to verify that someone's covered. So they have to call or mm -hmm. look up online, see if their coverage is valid. Mm -hmm. They have to um, make sure all their demographics are in place and it's in detail and they have to update it. They have to handle phone calls at the same time. And they also have to triage non-medically. If someone looks urgent or something, they have to notify someone that uh, there's something that needs, you know, needs to be addressed. Now, now you're open from when to when, uh, and generally? Um, in general, it's eight to five. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's just it's normal yeah. hours that you expect. Yeah. And yeah. what happens if I'm a patient of yours or one of your other doctors and at nine o'clock at night, I've got a problem. Well, we call. We <laughs> call, okay. Yeah, we, you know, we'll press one or I figure out what number it is. <laughs> okay. And it goes directly to our cell phone, whoever's on mm -hmm. for the night. Now, there's an urgent care mm -hmm. in Wainscott. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, there's no appointments. You sort of get in line mm -hmm. at eight o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. You hope you're not so far behind the line mm -hmm. that, you, that you can't get an appointment. Mm -hmm. and how does your practice work? Do, can I make an appointment with you? Or? Yeah, I definitely make appointments um, and we, you know, we schedule ahead, uh, you know, as, as most offices do. We leave some spaces during the day as in case someone calls in the morning and they need to be seen or people can walk in. And I've always had it as a walk-in. In fact, now I've separated into two separate waiting rooms. So one's like a sick room and one's like a regular waiting room. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So you want yeah. to stay out of that sick room? Yeah. Which I have a splinter. Then I'm like, do yeah. I, if I have a splinter, do I go into the sick room yeah. or the, the well room? You go, you know, in the urgent room, okay. you know, the urgent room or the walk-in room. Okay. And that. But it's just more efficient because a lot of people need a refill of a medicine and they're running behind and they didn't weren't didn't make an appointment in time and we, we get them in and we get it taken care of, which just saves more time than them mm -hmm. calling and then talking to someone and then asking for a refill and we don't get around to the end of the day. 
it just makes things go get to, get done and when they need to get done. Now, what kind of equipment do you have? In other words, you don't. I don't think you have an MRI or something like that in no. your office. In the building, we have you know, radiology, we have bone density, we have mammography. Mm -hmm. Those are the main things. The so office. The radiologist yeah. has an X-ray machine, but doesn't have beyond that, do they? Or well, the, that equipment is owned and run by Southampton Hospital. The ones in your building today? In our building. It's a separate suite in Southampton is runs it it's digital so the radiologist can get the report mm -hmm. can look at the x-ray remotely mm -hmm. and i get it too in mm -hmm. my office remotely so we can discuss oh it so together. it's called southampton hospital medical imaging or something like that yeah yeah i don't know what yeah yeah, yeah. So i mean it's, we a, have satellite. A, it's a satellite it's a satellite yeah. and how is that going to differ from what we're talking about now mm -hmm. having southampton hospital build some kind of a medical thing mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the town hall mm -hmm. on the playing fields. Well, mm -hmm. What's what's happening there? What's, what's well, that Well, that's going to be a freestanding emergency room, freestanding ER, basically level level one, which the difference is that in my office, if, if an ambulance has to go on a call mm -hmm. to somewhere in the community, um, they have to go to a designated ER level one. They cannot take that person to my office for oh, me really? to handle and save them a trip to Southampton. They and that is, is the is, driving force of getting this ER in. Is, is, that, is that one of these crazy state laws? Yeah. yeah. If someone had a splinter, they still couldn't take them to my office. So once I get into the ambulance, you are gone. I am, yeah. I am gone to yes, Southampton. Southampton. This, that, that's what and that's been a huge burden on our EMS system, our volunteer system. And that is the driving force. Oh, it takes it the ambulance hour, a driver yeah. three hours to get to Southampton, mm -hmm. check the person and in. And they come right back and they make 50 runs a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, yeah, and in the time, the delay, and so forth, and the inefficiency, and the cost. And so, you know, a lot of these... I, mean, I, I, well, I don't want to be grotesque right. about this, but mm -hmm. if, if I slash my hand, mm -hmm. and the ambulance comes, and obviously the EMS guy could put a bandage, yeah. or, mm -hmm. as I sit there bleeding, yeah. we're taking two, an hour and a half, or an hour to, in mm -hmm. the summer, an hour and a half, whatever yeah. it's like, to get to East, to get to Southampton, mm -hmm. and I could just go, I can't go in, they're not allowed to go into your mm -hmm. office. Yeah, but if he chose to walk into my office, because okay. he'd say, oh, I'd rather not go to the ER, then we could take care of so it. So if I get my neighbor to drive me in her car, yeah. I can go to the most efficient place, yeah. and if I have the EMS come by mm -hmm. state law, I'm sure, yeah. they must take me to a level one trauma mm -hmm. center, mm -hmm. and the closest happens ER. to be, yeah. Yeah. this is, abs I mean, this, this, th th this is one of those great absurdities of the world mm -hmm. where yeah, some, exactly. Some bureaucrat someplace yeah. is checking the box and says, oh, well, it's only about five mm -hmm. minutes to the nearest hospital, mm -hmm. except if you're in East Hampton. Right. And, yeah. and what's, so this, this new thing they're building is going to be a level one mm -hmm. trauma center. Mm -hmm. And what kind of equipment will they have there? The difference they'll probably have is a CAT scan and ultrasound. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main thing. Um, I think they're considering other uh, types of scanning to increase volume through there. They, I don't know if their plan is to get, say, an MRI, but to do more studies that are non-emergent to what, justify what, Just as a, as a lay person, yeah. you know, I always, I'm, I'm old enough that I, I go back and forth through all these tests, mm -hmm. but what do you use an MRI for that you could not use a CAT scan that they'll, that they'll definitely have in this new location? Well, for emergency rooms, historically, MRIs have not been used. Mm -hmm. And uh, CAT scans are quicker, and they do give information you need. Uh, so if I have a ha if I have a head trauma, I would have a CAT scan, yeah. not an MRI. Yep. And if, if it's a better test for that. Mm -hmm. And if I was if I were looking for uh, why a node appears on my lung, I would have. Among others, I would have a, mm -hmm. I would have an MRI. You may have well it depends on the thing, but yes, then there, when that's the decision tree goes, goes from there. But that's more elective. That's not on a time frame. So yeah, then the MRI its its um, advantages will be taken into account more. Well, this may sound like a harsh yeah. question, but yeah. my my guess is an MR a CAT scan machine costs three or four hundred thousand. An MRI mm -hmm. yeah. a million million and a half. It's is that probably <laughs> something like that? Yeah. Something in those ranges, yeah. So, yeah. so the operation of MRI is a lot more expensive. You need a specialized technician. The maintenance is more. Uh, yeah, it's a much more expensive. Oh, piece so of the uh, uh, an ER like they're going to have 
on those playing fields mm -hmm. would not have a person who spends all their time operating the CAT scan. It would be a person who has other functions and when necessary walks over and knows how to operate the CAT scan? Am I, over, am I oversimplifying it or? I, and you don't, you know, you're not personally You might have someone who knows how to do CAT scans that can run and do an x-ray, a mm -hmm. portable x-ray or Oh, do okay, an so the person would be trained to do CAT yeah, scans. possibly. And then have lower level functions as well. I, I can't imagine how they're going to do otherwise because of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the situation yeah. that will require it. But for example, an ultrasound, uh, that is a very pretty evolved skill. It's not just take, snapping a picture. It's a skill that takes a lot of training. They're, they're not going to go run and do a CAT scan. You're going to have a separate ultrasound person. Now, the, the ultrasound, I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I've had lots of daughters and lots of grandchildren. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the thing they do when they, when they want to show you the baby in the womb, which, which one is that? Is that, is that? That's a regular ultrasound. Okay. Yeah. They just have different probes and transducers. Right. And uh, different levels of training to, mm -hmm. to look at different areas. Yeah, that, that's changed yeah. dramatically. I remember. Yeah. The first time, there was this blurred picture, mm -hmm. and somebody says, can't you see the arm? And, you know, as a grandfather, I say, oh, sure, I can mm -hmm. see the arm. I mean, mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't even tell whether it was, it was just, yeah. my, my TV screen was bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's, it's amazing now. Yeah. So they'll have this equipment, and I'm no expert, but I've had some experience with the financing of some of these things. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have a lot of people walking through your CAT scan mm -hmm. to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I just, uh, mm -hmm. how many would they expect to see a day out here? I mean, in New York City, you go to the imaging center, you probably make an appointment two or three or four days in advance. Mm -hmm. And every half hour or 45 minutes, there's somebody going into that machine. It goes mm -hmm. nonstop, usually mm -hmm. from seven in the morning to 11 at night. Mm -hmm. S five or six or even seven days a week. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't see that, that volume being. Yeah. Well, that's how, the, in Southampton, how it's done. Mm -hmm. And they run the MRI, for example, even on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would think and, so. Uh, and, and same with you know, the other equipment, too. They, they run it all the time. And so whatever they do here, if, if they try to generate more of business, so to speak, from mm -hmm. elective outpatient stuff, um, it will be taken away from S the other hospital. Um, but uh, I guess they're going to figure that out. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's, it takes a lot of thinking what's going to happen from there. I mean, there, there's always convenience, and people love convenience. Well, I'll and, tell you, and, when, they, you when know, they open this place, yeah. every EMS driver mm -hmm. in, this, in East oh, Hampton, gonna South, so they're, they're going to be yeah. so happy. It's going to be wonderful then. Yeah. They're going to be, yeah, they'll be in heaven. And that is, the, that, like I said, that's, that's really what it's needed for mm -hmm. because of the rules that we have. And is, is it your idea, is it your, again, I know I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. asking you to get really deep into the weeds, but you're not personally mm -hmm. involved with it, but do you think they're going to staff it the same way you staff your office with people for 12 months a year on their payroll, or are they going to be more? Well, again, it's, it's, it's the type of thing, there's a basic amount you need in a, any hospital or medical setting. People have to have a certain level of a training, and it's hard for them to come and go. I'm sure that they're going to be able to shift employees around, mm -hmm. you know, but they have to have a minimum. Yeah, There's well, a certain my, minimum they have to have. Yeah, my guess is when, it, when it's busy here, it's busy in Southampton as well, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not, not that yeah. easy. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges you face or anybody faces out here mm -hmm. and how you overcome it. You know, you're, you're talking about, I think you said 15 people or yeah. 20? Yeah, maybe less, yeah. But less but than that. But those, those it's a lot of part-time, so okay. It, you know, it, but 15, yeah. 15 people. Mm -hmm. What percentage of them live within fifteen minutes of your office? Um, I'd say, well, currently, probably fifty percent, just to give a rough mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, but they, that's, these are people who have full-time, year-round jobs, or you know, a shift or. But they're, they're, they're pretty much employed 12 months a year here, one way or the other. It might be less than 50%. Okay. But Maybe 40, 30 sometimes. 40 and 30, okay. Because sometimes they come and they can't afford it and they go back to Riverhead because mm -hmm. it's too expensive to live here. And is Riverhead the point? Riverhead? Riverhead, Mastic. I have people from as far as uh, Miller Place coming. Wow. 
And Hampton Bays, is that another area where? Yeah, Hampton I mean, it just Bay. so happens to where, yeah. your, where your community yeah, well, is. Yeah, that's where they live, yeah. Uh, that, that translates to an hour and a half each way. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm blessed every day. I say, how do you guys get up in the morning and get here at a quarter to eight? Mm -hmm. Some come at 7.30 and then have to go home at six o'clock at night. I, you don't know, yeah. Do, have any of your employees indicated an interest in this new rail service that we're going to have basically from western Suffolk? Oh, yeah. Here? yeah there, I mean, there east was a Suffolk time when, when there was, when they were working on, on, the, on the main highway and they actually were putting in more trains mm -hmm. and they had more service and people were ecstatic. Uh, yeah. Oh, Our really? employees really loved it. Um, it was, that would have changed, that would have been a game changer for our, our practice. This makes like a funny question, but yeah. if somebody gets off the train in East Hampton, how do they get to your office? Well, I mean, besides, it's a walking. It's, it's a nice a twenty-five walk. minute walk, twenty twenty minute, twenty-five minute walk. Oh. But I mean, we easily just go and pick them up. It takes a few minutes. We can mm -hmm. just go and pick them up. It would be so easy. that's that's what your thought might be. That yeah, you, somebody would just go over, pick them up at mm -hmm. eight fifteen or whenever the train yeah. comes in, and a couple minutes back and forth. Don't make that's, a big deal of it. Yeah, okay. As much time as it takes to make a cup of tea. T is important. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, I've always thought, uh, or I've questioned how this rail service is going to work for the construction worker who has a big box of tools. But I know. Your yeah. people basically have a I know. A, I know. That's what I, I've given that a lot of thought, too. And I have thought about it, whether they keep to the job or have a place to have their vehicles, their big vehicles parked so that... They just come and get in their big truck with all its equipment and go to work. Um, that's kind of what I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. You know, the only the only place that you have hope of seeing that, I mm -hmm. think, is if the town is able to acquire and redevelop the sand pit in mm -hmm. uh, Wainscott. Mm -hmm. I mean, going back about 20 years or maybe even 30 years, I mean, it, it, this, this this town has multiple studies on almost anything you can think of, all you have to do is find somebody who remembers how to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're involved with the airport and we keep on doing things at the airport that were mm -hmm. done 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but nobody knows where it is today. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the most frustrating thing. But about 20, 25 years ago, and Larry Cantwell and other people were involved with it before Larry became supervisor, um, there was a study done of basically making a transportation hub in the Wainscott sand pit with a you know with with offices and and um, mm -hmm. uh, some commercial but, but the train would stop there mm -hmm. the buses would and it's a big enough area the buses mm -hmm. would go there uh, trucks as you say trucks could be over they could be overnight parking mm -hmm. uh, they could be overnight parking there or we've got a big airport and <laughs> a lot of places mm -hmm. to, to overnight park mm -hmm. within a short walk mm -hmm. of there. And with security because this would be your main concern. Would with, be with security. We, we got mm -hmm. cameras all over the place now. And, mm -hmm. and the only thing we haven't learned how to stop, although we're getting close, is you may not realize that the main runway, which we call the main runway at the airport, is euphemistically called a first-class drag racing strip. <laughs> and in the wee yeah. hours of the night, there are, dra there are a lot of, there's a lot of tire marks on the airport main runway and those are not from airplanes. <laughs> uh, every once in a while, they knock over a light. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. how we know they've been there. But we're gonna we're gonna fix that. But right now, <laughs> there's a lot of there is good security it's there. Now. A fun, safe place for the kids. It's to a have fun, it. safe place to, unless <laughs> the airplane is landing, <laughs> yeah. and then it, it's really messy. <laughs> but uh, so this this whole commuter thing is is something I think the town really hasn't. I mean, everybody talks about it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. except for this, finally, the railroad is coming. It must be like uh, the middle of Oklahoma in the 1800s. The, rail mm -hmm. the railroad's coming. Is it coming? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I think this is this a demonstration project this year. Is that the way it's going to work? Or I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I talked to Fred Thiel about six months ago or so and said it was coming somewhere mm -hmm. in 2019. Um, that's the extent of it. But my concern is really it isn't going to be an expense for the ridership. I mean, the fact is most mass transportation is, is subsidized with tax mm -hmm. dollars, even right. in New York City. Oh, yeah. So it has to be subsidized. And so how's that going to play out, mm -hmm. especially if the ridership doesn't really meet the same level that we really would like? 
if people don't jump on it. Oh, we'll, yeah. we'll get the teachers, we'll get a lot of people in small businesses that will come out here, the pharmacists I've talked to who come here, a lot of people come out here, they stop and shop, oh, everyone, a lot of people come out here from everywhere. So hopefully it would be a good ridership, but that's the big question. Well, the big, big question. What are the, what are the challenges do you have here besides just getting your people Hiring to physicians. Hiring physicians, okay. Cost of living's too high. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially primary care. Primary care is not the highest paid specialty. No, you want you want to you want to be a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. in uh, Manhattan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. or 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 a high end radiologist someplace mm -hmm. in the world. But the yeah, and uh, you know, so you know, when you're talking, you're getting a young physician. They're owing three to five hundred thousand dollars a year in loans now, mm -hmm. so they already have a mortgage. Now they're supposed to take on minimum seven hundred seven fifty, which. If can qualify for. That's, you're, you're the first person I've heard who mm -hmm. has given me a realistic number for a starter house in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When people talk about the starter house at four or five hundred thousand, everybody, mm -hmm. everybody says, oh, it's a, they don't yeah, exist. If you're a carpenter. Yeah, if you're a carpenter and, and, and you, you want to it, fix and it, can it, rebuild you, it, you're right. a fixer upper, but if you're a professional, well, you got to get, you got your whole life's devoted to something else. What is a, what is a starting general practitioner expect to earn out here? It's, it's, well, it's, out here it doesn't differ from anywhere else. Okay. One thing, that it's a level playing field. Mm -hmm. Insurance companies pay what they pay. Oh, okay. We don't determine the price. Oh, okay. That's, you know, there's a so myth. Whether, whether the insurance, whether the guy's living here in Westchester or... Mm -hmm. oh. In fact, in Tennessee, for whatever reason, in the south, southeast, is some of the highest paid insurance reimbursements. Well, no one knows why. George, our time is up. I okay. want to continue this because okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a nosy guy. Yeah. But I think it's very important for everybody to understand how our medical system works yeah. out here and, the, yeah. and some of the challenges I'm you've overcome. So yeah. And thank you so okay. much, really. Thank you.